I am sitting on the wide hood of an American army jeep between my two companions, travelling back along our road of retreat to where we came from. Turning myself around, I see the disapproving faces of the American soldiers and the threatening manner in which they point their pistols at us. Once again, a feeling of inner emptiness and infinite abandonment creeps over me. I try to bring some order to my thoughts while I stare at my field blouse, robbed of all decorations and badges. Where my national insignia was sewn, there is now a hole through which the white of my undershirt can be seen. On my left wrist is a band of white flesh, where, a short time ago, my wristwatch kept the skin from becoming tanned. Only my shaving kit remains. Pull yourself together, Helmut, I hear Brilla saying from what seems like a far distance. Shut up, barks an American behind us over the windshield. Kiss my ass, growls Brilla and spits contemptuously onto the right side of the road. The motor of the jeep hums monotonously as it distances us further from our intended goal with each passing minute. The thought comes, why didn't I put a bullet in my head? What purpose is there to living without freedom? especially now after the world in which I believed, for which I fought and bled, has collapsed. Who are these people, who, like highway bandits with no feeling of shame, plunder soldiers in their most bitter hour and enrich themselves in the most base manner on the misfortune of others? What will happen to us? What must the homeland face if these Americans are successful in pushing into the Reich? Like a strong stimulant, these thoughts make the blood flow hot from my heart through the veins, and create a new determination in every pore of my body. In full possession of my old spirit for life, I grab the hands of my friends and press them vigorously in the hope that they too will overcome this humiliation. A faint smile on their mask-like faces thanks me for the gesture. A warm stream of inner joy pulsates throughout me, with the certainty that I do not have to bear the coming misery alone. A quiet oath seals my readiness to stand by them in their highest hour of need. It is true that today we have fallen into the hands of robbers, but the fair fight in Normandy brings the conclusion that not all Americans are such miserable highwaymen as these. The fact that they have a sense of humour was proven during an episode that occurred near Saint-Sauveur. At that time, some Germans fell into their hands, including an 18-year-old who had the face of a child. After a quick decision, they cut his pants off above the knee, filled his pack with chocolate, hung a sign around his neck that read, We do not fight children, and sent him back across no man's land to his unit. It will be a hard loaf of bread that the future gives us, but the belief and hope that we will once again see our homeland shall shine for us like a star in the darkest night, and together we will endure what fate has prepared for us. The driver cuts the motor and turns left onto a field road, where fifteen tanks are assembled along the length of the meadow. The jeep stops by the tanks. With grinning faces, the troops pull us from the jeep. Helpless, the three of us stand in the middle of these foreign soldiers and let their mockery pass over us. The four rascals to whom we surrendered our weapons show the others our decorations, which they pull from their pockets. A tall American examines our medals and insignia with interest. On the sleeves of his wind jacket are three raised stripes and two lower stripes, indicating that he is a staff sergeant, the same rank as ours. With unconcealed admiration, he walks up to us and pats us on the shoulder. Good soldiers, he says, acknowledging us, and calls in incomprehensible English to the four soldiers who are busy examining the contents of our map cases. They respond by shaking their heads. Energetically, he turns from us and steps among the group of curious onlookers examining our equipment. A hail of words shoots from his mouth at the soldiers, to which one replies with the same intensity and tone. We listen, surprised, to the unintelligible exchange, recognising that a fight is looming over our medals. With the painful feeling in our chests that we are witnesses to and the cause of a strange family strife, we follow the spectacle that these farmer sons from the United States are carrying out. A pudgy older Yankee emerges from a tent situated between the tanks and approaches the arguing soldiers. On his cap and the corners of his shirt collar are two metal bars, identifying him as an officer. After a few sharp words directed toward the soldiers, the rabble becomes silent. 
With a stone-faced expression, he now approaches us and stands three paces away. His grey eyes wander from one to another. Taking an enormous cigar from his pouch, he shoves nearly half of it into his mouth. From the pockets of his jacket, he calmly pulls out a match, and then, with a quick strike against the low-hanging pistol holster, lights the match. Leisurely, he guides the burning match to the cigar, and, a second later, an impressive smoke cloud rings toward the sky. Staring at us with an unchanged expression, he calls several men to him with a snap of his fingers. Without taking the monstrous cigar out of his mouth, he speaks to the soldiers in a deep voice. Their grim faces promise nothing good for us. In the next moment, we are encircled by the Americans and feel their searching hands on all parts of our bodies. The entire contents of our pockets, including our wallets, fall before our feet. Before our eyes, strange, dirty fingers sort through our possessions, taking all money and photographs with military objects from our wallets. Bitterly, I see the picture of my wife disappear into the pocket of a dirty thief. Unmoved, the officer observes the shameless activity of his subordinates. Finally, they finish and indicate that we can pick up the lamentable remains of our possessions. A small truck, built like a jeep, emerges from the group of parked trucks with a howling engine and stops next to us. Five heavily armed Americans help us into the vehicle. They climb into the wagon after us and block the open back end of the truck with their bodies. Driving quickly, we travel back along the field way to the main road and after 15 minutes, turn left onto a small paved street, stopping suddenly in front of a large farm complex. Our guards spring elegantly from the truck and gesture spitefully, indicating that we should do the same. In stoic calmness, we leave the vehicle, unimpressed by the conduct of the Americans, and march towards six Frenchmen standing in front of the gate to the farmyard, armed with German rifles and pistols. They erupt in a war cry upon seeing us. Under the idiotic roar of these failures from 1940, we are ushered through the entrance to the yard and stand next to each other, facing the house wall. Yeah, do it quickly, you murderers, I think, expecting a bullet in the back of my neck. In seconds, my previous life flashes through my consciousness. But the seemingly endless minutes pass without anything happening until an unseen man calls out Brilla's name in German. Present, I hear Brilla answer indifferently. Come inside, the voice orders again. I glance to the left in the direction from which the voice comes. Unruffled, Brilla leaves the wall and saunters through the open door of a shed towards a standing American. Almost politely, the man leads him through the door. They are going to interrogate us, I whisper softly to Hocker. As a consequence, I receive a hard, painful blow to my right kidney, which takes my breath away and immediately silences me. Calmly and ready to meet with dignity whatever comes, I press my hands to the wall and stare with a bowed head at my boots until Brilla, after what seems like an eternity, is returned to us, and my name is called out clearly. Don't give them anything, I hear Brilla hiss, as I march like an unfeeling robot to the soldier at the door. The guard leads me through the door into a carpenter shop that has been set up as a temporary office. At a long table, sitting with his back to the door, is a massive figure whose insignia indicates that he is a high-ranking officer. The guard pushes me in front of him. In military form, I salute him with my hand at the corner of my cap and notice how the man across from me studies me critically. Bored, he acknowledges my salute and leans back comfortably in his chair, while one of the four men in the room serves him a cup of heavenly-smelling coffee and a plate with bread and corned beef. Exerting all the control I possess, I force my eyes away from the splendours before me, which I assume are there to tempt me. I immediately notice his suddenly alert look and wonder about his purpose. Disappointed, he reaches for his cigarettes, crosses one leg over the other, and turns to me with exaggerated friendliness. Since July 20th, the Nazi salute has been required in the German army. Why do you salute me with the old military salute? My tactfulness forbids me from using this salute of honour on an enemy officer, I answer firmly. So? He feigns surprise. Then you possess more tact than your Minister of Foreign Affairs, von Ribbentrop. Do you know that during one of his visits to the English king, he greeted him with Heil Hitler? I'm not aware of that, I respond indifferently. 
It is the truth. He emphasises his words and reaches for the coffee cup. How long have you gone without anything to eat? He turns to me and continues the conversation. For two days, I reply succinctly. Oh, then you must be terribly hungry. We will hurry so that we can get you something good to eat, he says to me in a concerned manner. I am not going to fall for that, I say to myself, although a terrible feeling of hunger rages inside me. But the officer's voice interrupts my thoughts. Your unit, please, he asks, reaching for paper and a pen. Here is my sold book, sir, I answer calmly, fingering my sold book out of my wallet. Curiously, he leafs through the pages and then hands it back to me. How is it that you have only just been captured? Your division was destroyed long ago, he inquires. I was in a hospital, I explain. So that's why, he indicates, satisfied. But after that, you were in a rocket launcher company. Where is it now? I was not in a rocket launching company, I counter his assertion. But this is a record of your troop strength and ammunition stock, he declares sharply, holding an old roster in front of my eyes that was in my pack. Naturally, that is from La Haye du Puits, I laugh at him. Don't lie, he bellows angrily in response. We have the means to make you talk, you can count on that. Here is my sold book. Everything I know and that would be of interest to you is in it, sir. Otherwise I have nothing else to give you, I say with deliberate calmness. I will give you the opportunity to reconsider it once again in quiet, he says, somewhat cooled down, gesturing to one of the men present to take me away. Prepared for any meanness, I walk ahead of the guard out the door, where another one receives me, leads me across the yard, and shoves me into an enclosed pigsty. The gate slams shut behind me. In the half-darkness, I examine my new quarters and am satisfied to find that the boars previously housed here were removed days ago, and due to the excessive heat, the straw is at least dry. Since it's impossible for me to stand up in the small stall, I shovel some straw into a corner and sink down upon it. It's too bad I don't have any matches with me to smoke one of the few cigarettes I still possess. What did the American officer mean with his crazy talk about rocket launchers? I only saw those weapons in action once in Russia. That was on October 2nd, 1941, near Vyazma. Damn it, those were the days. Squeaking, the door to the pigsty opens and bright sunshine floods my dungeon. From the perspective of a frog, I see the brown leggings covering the shoes and olive green pants of an American. Come out, you Nazi pig! He calls in a bent position into my quiet little chamber, grinning from ear to ear. Dumb dog, I think, and slip outside. Blinded by the glaring light, I shield my eyes with my hand as the guard takes me by the arm and guides me to the officer. Have you reconsidered the situation? He asks, looking at me cynically. Regarding that matter, there is nothing to reconsider. I respond honestly. Shall I put matchsticks under your fingernails like the Gestapo does to the Jews? He threatens. That will not turn me into a rocket launcher operator. I had nothing to do with that, I reply obstinately. What is this, written by your own hand? He again holds the list under my nose and points with a pencil to the signature on the backside of my old ammunition report. Mortar ammunition, I say dryly. And here, he points to the end of the list. 996 mortar grenades, I read aloud to him. So, he laughs triumphantly and folds the list. They are rocket launchers, isn't that true? No, just mortar grenades. Eight centimetre mortar grenades, sir, I correct him, laughing at the error. Why didn't you say that in the first place? He becomes angry and throws the pencil onto the table. You didn't ask me about it, I reply calmly. Get this fellow out of my sight he commands in German, visibly irritated and puffing on a cigarette. Apparently pleased with the failure of his superior, an older American, grey at the temples, turns to me and, behind the officer's back, gestures in a way that seems to say, let's leave the fool. I salute, turn on my heels and follow him, with the feeling that I have won a battle of wits against the officer and avoided medieval torture. I step alongside the somehow sympathetic older soldier, out into the open and across the yard, where he leads me into a shed. To my great surprise, there are about 30 German soldiers there, including Hocker and Brilla, 
A quick glance at the individual faces of the prisoners is enough to tell me, unfortunately, that I am not acquainted with any of the others. The shed, lacking a door and completely open in the front, apparently served the farmer as a coach house. As a result, two American soldiers stand several paces away, observing us intently and chewing with empty mouths, reminiscent of cows ruminating in a meadow. They are chewing gum, a non-commissioned officer explains in response to my query about their continual chewing. What did they want from you, Helmut? Hocker asks, concerned. They thought I was the leader of a rocket launcher unit. And that's why they locked you up in the pigsty? Brilla inquires in amazement. It wasn't that bad. If it doesn't get any worse, we can be satisfied, I reply to him calmly. Hopefully we will soon get something to eat, otherwise I'll die, Hocker mutters to himself. What time is it? I inquire, looking at the other Germans. A while ago it was 3 p.m., according to the Americans' watch, the non-commissioned officer informs me. Where are you from, comrade? I ask. From Neustadt, he sighs, sounding depressed. That's not too far from my home, I comment lightly. But unfortunately it can no longer be reached from here. The train has already departed, he says, lacking humour, then adds. We should have gone to the railroad station earlier, comrade. This morning they pulled me out of my girlfriend's arms. The French must have betrayed me. Where were you caught? I ask, interested. Naturally in Soissons. I could have hidden out for a long time with this voluptuous prostitute. She had food in abundance, let me tell you. Then it was about time the Americans saved you. Otherwise you would have had to serve in her court of love for a long time, I tease him. Not for too long, we will be home by Christmas, he asserts, convinced. Do you believe that Hitler will finally deploy his legendary secret weapon? I ask, hopeful. Hitler and secret weapons don't make me laugh, he responds disdainfully. No, the Americans will win the war and make us their 49th state, then we'll see how well we live. So that's it. I whistle through my teeth and turn away from him. My friends look at me with sad eyes. Don't let such idiots bother you, they whisper to me. It is unbelievable what kind of fools we have among us, I reply, shaking my head in disappointment. How about smoking? I ask my companions. Both shrug their shoulders. Why don't we try it? I suggest, taking out my cigarettes to offer them to my friends. Embarrassed, we ransack our pockets for matches while the guards watch. Regretfully, we show our empty hands to each other. Without interfering, one of the guards steps towards us and, in a friendly gesture, holds a burning lighter to our cigarettes. With a deep inhale, we pull the long mist smoke into our lungs and nod our thanks to the foreign soldier, who acknowledges it as he returns to his position. There are both good and bad among them, I conclude. Those two seem to be all right, Hocker seems to read my thoughts, if they would just give us something to eat. Be a little patient, Willie. We will surely be fed soon. The interrogation officer knows that I haven't had anything to eat for two days. I comfort Hocker, while my own terrible hunger torments me. That is what I told him as well, he now laughs, causing me to lose faith. Did you tell that fellow that you belong to an alarm battalion? Brilla asks, interested. No, I was ashamed to utter the name of this heap, and he didn't ask at all, I answer softly. We simply laid down our sold books in front of him, and there was nothing entered in them. He already knew about our old division, and so he did not ask any questions about it, Briller explains to me. That's clear, I say. The outcome has been decided, and they are no longer interested. I add my commentary. In the meantime, rain clouds gather, and the first drops drizzle onto the hot stone pavement in the yard, causing steam to rise. The nearby poplar trees begin to sway in the increasing wind. Our guards are replaced. Two others, clad in raincoats and armed with small, rapid-fire weapons and ammunition belts, take their places, staring at us with apparent bad moods. The soft hum of motors in the sky captures our attention. As the noise grows louder, our trained ears recognise the familiar sound of the ME-109, a staple across all the battlefields of this war. Like a bolt of lightning from the bright sky, it dives almost vertically out of a cloud bank, firing tracer ammunition at an American fighter plane below. 
The American pilot maneuvers the badly damaged metal bird upward, a black, thick stream of smoke billowing from its engine. The ME-109 swoops over the farm at low altitude and vanishes in an elegant turn before the enemy anti-aircraft guns can react. Concurrently, as the American plane climbs skyward, a dark bundle descends towards the earth until a white parachute unfurls, gently bringing the pilot back to ground. The plane, now pilotless, staggers in the sky for a few seconds and then, as if struck by a colossal fist, explodes in a massive ball of flame and is scattered by the winds. We exchange glances of happiness with each other. Once again, we witness war as we know it. Only slowly does the reality of our own predicament creep back into our awareness. I instinctively feel the gaze of the American guard on me and turn to look up at him. A faint smile is visible on his face, and a wink indicates his recognition of the German pilot's skill. These guys are fair, Hocker whispers to Brilla and me. I wish I could be certain of that, I respond, digging out my cigarettes. Once again, we place the cigarettes between our lips and look questioningly towards the Americans. A sergeant navigates his way to us along the outer edge of the shed, from whose roof rainwater trickles down in silvery streams from the leaky gutters. He attempts to light our cigarettes with his wet matches. The guards follow his vain attempts with interest. Finally, one of them steps toward us and holds his burning lighter to our cigarettes after they make themselves understood. No good, German matches, the sergeant babbles trustingly, but the American merely shrugs his shoulders and returns to his position. You old fool, I hiss angrily at him. You've been lighting fires with German matches your entire life, and suddenly now, in the eyes of the Americans, they're no good? Do you believe you can improve your circumstances with this stupid prattle? I am convinced that every clear-thinking opponent feels nothing but contempt for someone who soils their own nest. What would you have thought of a Russian prisoner in a similar situation who chattered about his matches, which worked fine in dry conditions, and which he used just a short time before to light a cigarette while standing behind his machine gun to defend his land? I turn away in disgust from this characterless scamp, who, without a word in response to my accusations, slips back into the dark shed and mingles with the other Germans. We will have a lot of trouble in the future with our dear comrades if they continue to behave this way, I say, bowing my head in shame. I would have liked to bust him in the nose, but we cannot show such conduct to the Americans if we expect them to respect us, Hocker says, just as angry. We must hold out and watch out for ourselves, otherwise we will be overwhelmed by our grief, Brilla warns us, just as the sound of a truck engine in the back of the yard drowns out his last words. Now surely there will be something for us to eat, Hocker suggests, and all the men behind us become restless, like cows in a stall that can smell their feed. Only two men at a time, a tall American calls out, standing on the tailgate of the truck and holding up two fingers. The truck is completely empty, and its bed is freshly washed. Go ahead, the tall American gestures as we hesitate in front of the empty vehicle and look to Brilla. We quickly grab onto the sides and climb up, with Brilla following next. Happy to be together, we forget our disappointment and become curious about where they will take us. Surely there, we will get something to eat since it's at least 6pm. In no time, the truck is fully occupied by German soldiers. The last to get on are three SS men with badly torn uniforms and swollen faces. The Americans chase the men angrily back into the shed and slam the tailgate of the truck closed with one hand. Three powerful Americans, armed with pistols, make their way through the crowd and climb onto the truck. Slowly, the vehicle begins to move with its sorrowful cargo, reaching the main road within a few minutes and rolling westward at an accelerating speed. After about 30 minutes of travel, we see five American tanks encircled on the other side of the road, close to the edge of a nearby wood. In the middle of the circle, we recognise about 300 Germans crouching on the ground. Slowly, our vehicle turns onto a field road and rumbles toward the tanks. Our captured comrades look at us curiously as the truck stops and we are instructed to get out. Line up in two rows, we are ordered by an excited and unbelievably fat American, whose shape brings laughter from us. Macht schnell, he screams angrily, noticing our lack of respect for him. 
That fellow has eaten way too much for us to take him seriously. I chuckle in high spirits to those around me, prompting laughter from them as well. We quickly form two rows, hoping that we will finally receive something to eat. Once again, the three of us stand in the front row, looking for provisions, but none are in sight. Instead, two unarmed Americans stand three steps away from us, and, upon a signal from the overweight officer, begin going through our pockets. Afterward, we are herded through a line of cynically grinning Americans, where a couple of US soldiers, armed with red lacquered clubs, urge us to sit down. Don't they give you anything to eat here? I ask the unknown fellow sufferers beside me. No, only the club, if you don't make yourself small and unnoticeable, an older corporal answers. That can be bad for us, Hocker comments, sad and dejected. Do you know when we will be sent on? I inquire of the corporal. Not today, for sure, he replies, resigned to his fate and lying on his back in the wet grass. Fortunately, the rain has stopped. We smoke in silence, pondering how long our supply will last. I will make an inventory, I say, interrupting my friend's gloomy thoughts. I lay out the rest of my possessions between my widespread legs, a letter case with a diary, four small photographs of my wife and me in Strasbourg, a list of my belongings in our apartment at home, marching orders from Paris to Le Bourget, a telegram from my wife reporting bomb damage to our apartment, my sold book, a handkerchief, a full pen and a pencil stump, 31 German cigarettes, the wedding ring on my finger, my shaving kit with a razor and 20 blades, a half-used bar of soap, a shaving brush, a can of shaving cream and a small bottle of aftershave lotion. You came away very well, the corporal comments as I pack my belongings back into my bag. It's not over yet, Brilla adds. How many cigarettes do we have in total? I ask, reporting my 31. I have 23, Brilla announces. And I have 44, Hocker says proudly. That makes 98 cigarettes in total, I conclude. Let's give eight to the corporal so he can also smoke, I suggest, handing him five, with Hocker adding another five. So he has ten, Hocker laughs generously. Thank you, the corporal says, visibly moved. As night falls, only the glowing lights on the tanks reveal the American's location. Before I starve to death here, I'm going to escape, Hocker whispers resolutely. We wouldn't get past the tanks alive, Willie, I caution against his rash plan. It's impossible, Brilla agrees, and a tank machine gun firing tracer ammunition into the woods proves his point. At least let us sleep in peace, you gangster. A man from our group yells, annoyed by the machine gun noise. We are hungry, someone else shouts bravely. Anyone who mutinies will be shot, an American voice booms from near the tanks, casting a brooding silence over the captive soldiers. Overcome with fatigue and weakened by hunger, we fall into a restless sleep on the cold, wet earth. When I awake from a terrible sleep, the first thing my eyes behold is the leaden grey sky. Tormented by absurd dreams, it takes considerable time for me to find my way back to reality. Shivering from the wet and cold, I survey my surroundings. Mist and thin fog clouds hover over the prisoners huddled tightly together. Here and there, someone attempts to warm themselves through deep knee bends or by running in place. The American guards, wrapped in their warm brown coats with glimmering yellow-gold brass buttons, stand on the ground and sit on the tanks, their automatic weapons at the ready. A gnawing hunger rages in my empty stomach. Sleep still grips my two companions with its compassionate hands while my thoughts drift homeward. Now the field mail service, which previously connected the front to the homeland, has been severed. Weeks will pass before my family is informed of my fate via Geneva. Many days and nights of uncertainty will weigh on them as they wonder about me. An immense longing overcomes me and compels me to stand. With numb legs, I wander along the edge of the assembly area to restore feeling to my limbs, organise my thoughts and regain composure. Since 1940, I have witnessed countless soldiers from opposing nations fall into German captivity. Their fate was certainly no less difficult than mine. I estimate that since the war began, over a million German soldiers have been taken prisoner in places like Africa and Stalingrad. 
I cannot consider myself so important now, especially as a terrible hunger weighs me down, and all the recent meanness and humiliation threaten to push me to the brink of doubt. Numerous situations during the war seemed hopeless and brought me face to face with death. Yet to this day, fate has been kind to me and provided a way out of every situation. This time in prison will also pass, perhaps sooner than I think. It depends entirely on me how I endure and overcome it. I recall the saying I learned at my confirmation, which has guided me throughout my life. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes be pleased with my ways. Well, we shall see why I had to become a prisoner at this time. They will not allow us to starve. Otherwise, they would have executed us on the spot and saved themselves the trouble of transporting and guarding us. A prisoner is ballast for the enemy, if not an immediate danger. We require guards and provisions. The former are needed at the front, and the latter depend on supply convoys. Therefore, we are not as useless as I previously thought. And then there are my two friends whom, fortunately, I became acquainted with while we were still free. Perhaps Providence has arranged it this way. During my wandering, I come unexpectedly upon a group of German staff officers sitting on the edge of the camp area. Among them is even a general staff officer, distinguishable by the red stripe on his trousers. Amazed, I stand there, observing the gentlemen who still wear their medals. It's a mystery to me how these high-ranking officers, who must have known about the situation at the front, could have been captured. Or did they surrender to the Americans by choice? In the hospital, I heard rumours about such officers. I think he is crazy, I overhear an older major saying to the others. Slowly, I turn around and stare at one of the tanks, while my ears keenly absorb the officer's conversation. He didn't listen to Rommel or Rundstedt. Instead, he just ordered a vigorous defence without getting a correct picture of the situation, one of them says in a sullen voice. You couldn't expect anything better from a corporal, another adds dismissively. And I don't understand Keitel, who must be informed about everything yet still accepts Hitler's orders. He must be one of the first to realise that his Führer is crazy, and yet after the 20th of July, he openly declared his loyalty to him. Another notes in an objective tone. What would you do in his position when every step is watched and spies are following you? The Major asks angrily. We don't know enough about the situation, gentlemen, so we'd better just drop the subject. A clear voice concludes the conversation. Deep in thought, I search for my friends, who are sitting on the ground, smoking and watching for me. Back from your early morning exercise, they greet me laughing. I come directly from a section of the division staff and report to you obediently that the Führer is crazy. I respond, sitting down among them. They look at me with obvious doubt, chuckling to themselves. Have a smoke, Helmut. Hocker offers me a cigarette while continuing to study my face. I'm not crazy, you sleepyheads. I just wanted to move around a bit and happened upon a conversation among some high-ranking German prisoners. I clarify, removing any doubts about my sanity. Is there really a general here? Brilla asks, piqued with curiosity. No general, but a general staff officer with the rank of colonel, I explain, recounting what I overheard. They always babble about such stupid things and then lick Hitler's boots when they receive the Knight's Cross. Brilla dismisses the talk about the officers. Hitler is crazy for them now that he's no use to them, Hocker adds contemptuously. Still filled with bitterness, I look toward the edge of the woods from which a group of Americans is approaching. When they reach the German staff officer, they stop. After a brief conversation, the German general staff officer salutes and walks into the centre of the assembly area. Listen up, everyone, he calls out with a clear voice. The Americans have just informed me that in half an hour we will be transported from here. They request that as soon as the trucks arrive, we assemble in five rows for quick and easy loading. We are headed to a collection camp where we will immediately be given something to eat. Nothing will be taken from anyone. On this occasion, I ask you personally to maintain order and discipline to make a good impression on the Americans. Amid the curses and maledictions of the prisoners, he turns and walks back to his place, his ego seemingly bolstered by the Americans. We should secure our cigarettes, Brilla suggests, taking his three packs of cigarettes out of his pants pocket. We follow suit, 
removing all our cigarettes from the packages and hiding them under the hems of our field blouses. In future searches, I plan to keep my wedding ring hidden under my tongue. Only my shaving kit, which I must carry in my open hands, remains in potential danger. Two Americans armed with pistols mount the truck, now completely loaded with Germans, and hold tight to the wooden stakes used for the canvas covers. Finally, the black drivers slam the cab's door shut. With a jeep occupied by four Americans leading the way, the convoy slowly gets underway and reaches the highway. Travelling at about 35 miles an hour, we roll westward through the area recently conquered by the Americans. After half an hour, we make a sharp turn southward. We speed toward a village lying like a picture of pure peace, nestled against the edge of the road. In the village are beds and food, restaurants with cool drinks and lusty girls. Everything a soldier longs for, but which is now unattainable for us. Everything inside me strives to believe that this will be possible again. As the lead truck reaches the first houses in the village, it is greeted by the inhabitants standing along the street. But suddenly we are confronted with the harsh reality in the form of rotten tomatoes, rocks and fists raised in threat. In frenzied rage and with wild, distorted faces, the French reveal their true feelings for the first time in this war, and what they really think of us. A barrage of dirt and a volley of insults crash against us as we pass through this indignant crowd. How is something like this possible? I grumble to myself as the ordeal ends and we roll through the poorly cultivated fields. You stupid German rube, I admit to myself. You always imagined they liked you because you were so nice and friendly toward them. Greatly disappointed, I look at my fellow countrymen who, like me, can only shake their heads in bewilderment at the French. I feel utterly forsaken by God and the world. My stomach cramps and every nerve is in rebellion. An indescribable feeling of homesickness fills my breast, far exceeding all the bodily pain I have ever known. It's as though I have lost a loved one. But before I can control my feelings, we travel through a small city and experience the same thing. We are lucky that the Americans sitting alongside us point their pistols at the threatening Frenchmen. Otherwise, they would tear us from the trucks and trample us to death. An old, ugly hag with a swelling on her forehead as big as a tennis ball pours her chamber pot out of a window upon the defenceless German prisoners in the vehicle stopped in front of us. A hail of stones, which our comrades had caught from the French, crashes into the window of the old woman, and she immediately clears out, disappearing into the interior of the house. Finally, the convoy continues on. Completely filthy, we escape from this awful town with its miserable people, who act in raving madness to shower their hatred on defenceless prisoners. That's the way it is with the Grande Nation, I turn to Brill. And we must handle them with kid gloves so that we don't hurt their pride, Hocker replies angrily. Just once in my life, I would like to pass through this nest with my machine gun platoon, Brilla thunders, slamming his fist on top of the cab, causing the driver to hit the brakes and then give the truck gas so that the passengers tumble on top of one another like sacks of potatoes. Keep yourself under control, old man, otherwise you will have to get out and go by foot, I joke with my furious friend, who clamps a cigarette between his lips and waits impatiently for a light, while another prisoner pulls, with considerable difficulty, a match from his deep coat pocket. Gradually the ride becomes uncomfortable. Like animals for the slaughter, we remain squeezed together in a stupor. Finally, the convoy nears Paris and we begin to prepare for the stormy reception we expect there when the lead truck takes the road to Saint-Denis, which we reach after half an hour of slow travel. Prepared for everything, we stare at the few passers-by on the streets who hardly notice us at all. The quiet with which the citizens take our arrival seems unreal to us. To my complete surprise, I discover behind the closed window of a house an older man and two girls who wave furtively to us with their handkerchiefs, not until we exit the city do a couple of young punks and pious hookers, with their repulsive gestures, blur the good impression that Saint-Denis has made upon us. Already the sun is setting in the west over the sea, when, near Chartres, we leave the main road and take a secondary one to a meadow surrounded by barbed wire, where about a thousand German soldiers are held. I notice a ditch filled with water meandering through the meadows, 
awakening in me an insane feeling of thirst. Others in the convoy also see the water, causing a dangerous commotion. But the Americans have the situation under control, with a large number of soldiers armed with clubs to maintain order as the trucks are unloaded. It is only with brute force that they succeed, after a few minutes, in lining us up in marching order. Again and again, they swing their clubs at the dried-out bodies of the prisoners, bringing the half-madmen to reason. I am pushed forward by the herd of prisoners, while Brilla's tight grip prevents me from falling to the ground. If we don't get something to eat here, then we will take off tonight, he says, full of doubt. Unable to utter another word, Hocker nods, his eyes sad in agreement. Finally, the guards open the gate made of tree trunks. Our pockets are searched again before we are allowed inside the enclosure. Only the thought of escape gives us the strength to stand upright and patiently allow ourselves to be searched. By now, I no longer care what they take from me. My eyes see only the canvas bags in the enclosure where the first of our transport are gathered and drinking from the familiar spouts. Even before the searcher's dirty fingers are off me, I push my way forward and under one of the taps of the water container. Greedily, I suck the precious water out of the bag like a piglet at its mother's nipples, and do not move away until Brilla squeezes in next to me. Although my thirst is not fully quenched, I look around for Hocker and find him lying on the ground, completely drained of strength. I drag him next to Brilla, who steps aside so Hocker can get some water. Only now do I find the time and interest to survey the area. The men from my transport lie in a wide circle, resembling a field of mown-down crops, while some of our predecessors board the trucks to be further transported. Still yearning for water, I realise it's no longer possible to reach the bags, now surrounded by a massive ring of thirsty men. Much later, Hocker returns with his field blouse soaked and collapses in the grass beside us. They will turn us into perfect pigs if this continues, Brilla mumbles sarcastically to himself. Maybe that's what they want, to erase our belief in a master race, I mock. They'll only achieve the opposite, proving how primitive they are, he retorts with ridicule. For now, I don't care about that. If only they'd give us something to eat. After taking our freedom, they at least owe us that. Hocker says, his tear-filled eyes evoking such sympathy in me that I'd commit murder for a piece of bread for him. Don't talk about eating, Willie, or you'll just get hungrier, Brilla advises in an irrational tone. Seems like the fresh air here is enough for you, happy just to have saved your dirty hide. Hocker, enraged, snaps at Brilla. Stop trying to kill each other, that will be the beginning of the end, I intervene, hoping to prevent a futile conflict. Defiantly, each turns his back to the other and stares at the ground. It has come to this. Our hunger drives us to attack one another. This realisation fills my heart with an unprecedented hatred for the Americans. We must attempt escape at any cost. The desperate decision to escape this misery or die trying consumes me. Let's get some water to drink, friends, I suggest, aiming for reconciliation. Without a word, they follow me to the water tank where we lie under the spouts and quench our thirst. At least inwardly united, we return to our previous spot and collapse in the grass, where I keep an eye out for the Americans. What do you think of that? I nudge my two companions, pointing at a group of Americans entering the enclosure with boxes on their backs, then stacking them up. If there's no food for us, I'll eat grass for the rest of my life, Hocker declares after a long silence. You won't have to. I respond cheerfully, noticing the Americans removing the bands and lids from the boxes. A steady stream of people moves towards the boxes. We too shuffle close to the distribution area, watching with hunger-tamed eyes like shy deer as the Americans bring in and open more boxes. One of them then asks me, speak English? A little, I reply coolly. Please line the men up in five rows right now, he instructs tossing a small can into the air and catching it like a ball. Fighting back my excitement, I climb atop a nearby stack of boxes and address my comrades. Listen up, I call out in a voice foreign even to me. The Americans want us to form five lines for food distribution. Keep a three-step distance between each row and hurry up so we can finally get something to eat. If I had thought I knew how to handle soldiers before, I am now bitterly disappointed.
The men react to my words like a frightened herd of sheep chased by a fierce dog. Instead of forming lines, they scramble to the front, trampling the weaker ones without any regard. Get in five rows, then we'll get our provisions faster. I try again to bring some order to the chaos. Shut your mouth, you pretender. A private, standing at a distance, shouts. We don't need a sergeant any more. Get down from your throne and get in line yourself. Ashamed, I jump off the box and join Hocker and Brilla, who are seething with anger. Come over here, a red-haired American signals to us, handing us three small cans from the box. It's okay, boys, we can wait until they line up, he tells his comrades, sounding gloomy. Annoyed by the lack of discipline among our fellow German prisoners, we step aside. Such idiots! Hocker curses, looking at the small can in his hand. Who would have thought they'd fall apart like this, especially in front of the Americans? That's the state of the famed German discipline, I say dejectedly. But let them be. I'm not going to worry about them. If they don't need a sergeant any more, then we don't need any privates either. We observe the disgraceful scene as the Americans mercilessly beat the German prisoners with their red lacquered sticks for trying to force their way to the boxes. It had to come to this, I say bitterly, sitting down. They don't deserve any better, Brilla remarks unmoved, staring at the can in his hand. Damn it, I'm so hungry I could eat a bloated cow. How am I supposed to open this can? Brilla complains. I rummage through my shaving kit for something to open the can with while Hocker searches the ditch for a sharp-cornered stone. Brilla bangs his can against the iron on his heel until a white broth gushes out of the hole. He quickly brings the can to his mouth and begins sucking out its contents. What is inside? I ask, trembling with eagerness and listening to the noise Brilla makes while trying to eat from the can. It tastes like carrots and meat, he answers. Filled with impatience, we pound our cans against our iron heels. Finally, a hole appears in mine, but I can't extract any juice even as I suck on it desperately. It smells like ham or eggs, I muse aloud. Then the stuff in my can must be spoiled and I've swallowed the broth, Brilla laments in despair, tossing the can into the grass. Hocker returns with several stones in his hands. Like woodpeckers, we work on the cursed cans with the sharp rocks until a long crack opens in the side. With the aid of my razor, I pry it wider. Now I squeeze the index finger of my right hand through the crack, drilling into the soft contents. Twisting it slightly, I extract it from the can, quickly bringing a portion of the pudding-like mass to my mouth. Uncertain of what I'm eating, I continue this process until it's evident that the can is empty, though my hunger intensifies. Terribly disappointed, I look at my comrades who, still hopeful, search their cans for any remaining morsels. Angrily, I toss the empty can into the ditch and stare at my index finger, which is clean on the upper half in contrast to the others. We never washed our hands before eating, despite water being readily available. Hungry, disillusioned and despairing, we collapse on our backs in the grass, staring at the almost cloudless sky where the first stars are already visible. Along the barbed wire, the guards light small campfires. We should find a place for the night. Hocker suggests, gloomily breaking our silence. It's very damp here along the ditch. We rise without a word, surveying the fenced-in meadowland. It doesn't matter, Brilla says, beginning to pull out grass to prepare a place to lie down. Don't bother with that, Brilla, Hocker interrupts him weakly. Down there, where I found the stones, there's dry reed grass and bulrushes that will make a good mattress. Weak need, we walk along the ditch to the spot Hocker discovered. Listlessly, we gather the sparse grass, carry it to a dry area, and pile it up. Exhausted, we lie down on it. How long will it be until we sleep in a real bed again? That thought echoes in my tired mind. How wonderful it would be to turn into birds and fly home. What are they doing and thinking at home right now? Do they sense something has happened to me? My last letter was written in Le Bourget on August 17th. My letters returned to the senders will shock them terribly. We must risk escape to spare our loved ones from such distress. We could head eastward at night, across the fields, sustaining ourselves on fruits and plants. Within a month we could reach the Rhine, or a bullet might end our misery. 
We don't know if the Americans will assign us to a farmer, as is customary in Germany. At least then we'd have food and a bed. Maybe the German divisions will return and free us. Surely Hitler will counter the Allies' advance on the Marne and in the Ardennes with his offensive. Then the French will scorn the Americans as they now do us? I wouldn't want to be a Frenchman then, considering the retribution they'll face after showing their true colours. Is it weakness or natural sleepiness that envelops us in such stillness, allowing these thoughts to swirl in our minds?